The machine I lay before you is the RCA Selectivision Video Disc Player from 1981. This was the very first RCA Selectivision machine, and it was the beginning of a hilarious flop in the video format war. You see, the Selectivision was designed, or initially uh, dreamt up in the mid-1960s. They were trying to figure out a way to record video onto a vinyl record, or a disc similar to a vinyl record, using similar technology. And after several trials and errors, it took about 17 years before the technology finally matured enough to become a sellable product. By that point, it was the early 1980s, and VHS, U-Matic, uh, LaserDisc, Betamax, and there could be one or two I'm missing, were all fighting for the slot to become the number one video player. Because the select division was so limited in its design, the video quality wasn't as quite, quite as good as LaserDisc, but it was better than VHS at the time. Um, but the discs were so enormous, heavy, and thick, that the technology ultimately waned, and it had its limitations. Uh, one of the biggest limitations is pretty evident in the clip I just played back for you. Um, the discs wear out quickly, in fact. Um, and not only that, but the machine itself requires maintenance. It requires belt replacements and stylus cartridge changes. Because after all, this does use a stylus much like a phonograph. And even though the technology is different, it has a lot of similarities. Later in this video, we're going to actually take this unit apart and see what really is going on inside there. I struggled to get this door open, which I've done a hundred times before. My. There we go. This is how you change the stylus cartridge. Basically, you open this door, which is spring-loaded, and pop out this unit here. Those of you familiar with phonographs have already a good understanding of what a stylus looks like. But this is what a video disc stylus looks like. It's a little different. The cartridge doesn't include the cartridge element or the, um, the pickup element that you would see in a phonograph, but it does come in a replaceable, easy-to-handle package, which is how it got the name cartridge. Unlike a vinyl record player, or a phonograph, I should say, the video disc player doesn't pick up vibrations from the needle. Actually, it senses changes in capacitance on the disc itself. How that works specifically, I haven't a clue, but I have a rough idea. Here's how I think it works. I believe the platter is um, blasted with a signal from the um, from the, uh, the tone arm, and or it could be. You know, I really don't know. <laughs> I I don't know how it works. I'm going to be honest with you guys. My my original my original thought was that perhaps the disc, which is conductive, by the way, um, receives a a signal or a pulse or something from either the hub or something like it. And that signal is is actually picked up by the stylus itself, which is conductive as well. And the variances in the capacitance of the disc itself within the groove are what form the FM signal uh, which in which the audio and video signals are encoded. And then the uh, tone arm contains electronics that then transmit that signal to where it is decoded on the PC board into a viewable video and audio um, com composure or composition. That's how I think it works. But I'm not really sure, and the wiki article doesn't really dig into that. It talks about waveforms, peaks, and landings, but it doesn't talk much about the signal itself and how it's transmitted into the amplifier and decoded. So we'll just speculate on that one for now. 
How the device really works, though, is really just a sophisticated phonograph. I mean, it couldn't be simpler. And that's probably why this device was so inexpensive in relation to VCRs and Betamax machines of the time period. I believe there was another manufacturer that produced a similar product, and I think it was JVC. But you can verify that on Wikipedia, where the article is pretty well spelled out for you guys. And you can then figure it out on your own. But the controls of this machine are quite simple. Um, we're going to load another disc in here. Duran Duran. So what we're going to do is we're going to load it by switching the unit into load on load. The discs, because they're so sensitive in their design and construction, much like phonographs, you can't handle them with your hands because even a fingerprint will destroy the disc. So to combat that problem, RCA packed the disc in a convenient cartridge. And you'll notice that some cartridges come in a blue sleeve and some come in a white sleeve. The difference is the blue sleeve cartridges are stereo, the white sleeves are monorail. Because this is the very first version of the video disc player, it actually has a monorail um, audio circuit. But regardless, we can still play the stereo cassette or stereo cartridge in the unit. Now I'm going to open this door up again, and you'll get a better view again at the end of this video when we actually pull the covers off, and you can actually see it run um, bare open to the world. <laughs> Watch the cartridge as it's loaded into the machine. So what we're going to do is slide it in. A door lacks, or latches onto the, um, the inner rim and it unlocks the cartridge from the inner, I'm sorry, the inner plate with the disc contained within it. So it locks in, boom, and you pull the outer sleeve out and the disc remains. Not only the disc, but the outer frame as well, which actually uh, it contains the disc. Yeah, keeps it centered. And there we go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to switch the unit into the play function, or play mode, where the disc will begin spinning momentarily. Because the switch is a little worn out, there it goes. Now the disc is spinning. And it is queuing up or reading the disc. There we go. This is actually the later version of the RCA logo opening of every um, every Select Division disc. The one we just saw on Tales from Muppet Land was the earlier version or the first version of that. Of course you have your copyright warnings. But what we're going to do is we're going to scan the disk using forward and back um, controls. There's two controls for um, jumping around on the disk. You have your rapid access and your visual search. Visual search works a little bit like the um, the play fast forward mode on a VCR, or the the mode as it as it works when the um, disc is in play mode. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. Pretty much get what I'm laying down for you. So rapid access takes the needle and picks it up instantaneously off the disc, and it lets you advance. Is up to, I think it's 63 or 64 chapters. Let's see. And it lets you skip from one chapter to the other. And then once you land into that chapter, you can use the visual search to go backward, which you couldn't do this on a VHS machine at that time period without it being really grainy. You can also go forward. Wait a minute. Is she wearing a bra? Anyway, the forward function doesn't seem to work as well. It actually gets kind of comical. Looks like they're having seizures. But anyway, so there you go. 
Well, we can go for we can go forward or back. We just can't go forward. <laughs> Okay, there you go. But this uh, display will show, I believe it's up to 60-something uh, spots. Oh, we've hit error because we have no recorded material where we landed. Let's see. Nope, error. I wonder if this disk is indexed. Now, the pause feature it's pretty cool because what it does is it just lifts the needle off and everything stays spinning. The um, the tone arm, we'll call it a tone arm, but it's not really, stays in position. So I could leave this for five days, six days, however long I feel like walking away. Press pause again and it resumes right from where I left off. So this disc um, appears to be indexed in a, in a way. It goes up to 48. Band 1 through 12. Let's play this again here. 48 is the very last... Is there something I should know? Was that 52? 50, yeah, so... Okay. Anyway, so that's that. Now what if we want to stop the disc and return and resume later? So all I have to do is hit off. Everything stays in position, so I don't have to reposition the tone arm when I resume. So I could again, instead of pausing it, I could just stop it by hitting the off switch and everything stays right where it is. Now if I start it back up again, reaches speed. The needle should drop down. There it is. Right back to where I left off. There's no need to rewind or fast forward or whatever. Um, I'm sorry, there's no need to rewind the disc. Obviously it's a disc. There's no tape to rewind. You, you get my point. I don't have to return that tone arm back to its home position because if I take the disc out it automatically pushes it back. Um, put it in the load unload mode. So I slide the the uh, the envelope back in, and it pushes the tone arm back because when this is in the load position, the tone arm is disengaged from the servo motor. And then pull it out and watch something else. Pretty cool. So yeah, these machines were only in production for. I think they were only in production for like two or three years. The discs themselves, I believe, ceased production in 1986. And RCA lost $600 million on this idea. Thanks to Laserdisc and VHS, the two predominantly successful video formats. Hell, even Betamax was more successful than Selectivision. Um, but... I want to show you what the disc actually looks like. To do that, I'm going to move into a more brightly lit section of my house, and that being the kitchen. Okay, here is one of the discs. This was heavily damaged, so um, I actually, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't damaged. This one was, um, it was missing the second section. See, you could only record about 30 minutes per side on one of these, and for a movie that is more than an hour long, you had to split it between two discs. If the other disc is missing or damaged, there's no point in having, you know, you've pretty much lost half the movie. So this is my sacrificial lamb. I'm actually uh, going to test some stuff on this one. So as you can clearly see, it's highly reflective. There is a metalized, I believe it's nickel, inside the disc. It's a multi-layer disc. It looks and feels like vinyl, just like any other record. These were actually produced in mass on record stamping machines that were modified uh, for the high density track layout. These tracks are very high density um, in in their uh, spacing. The spiral groove is about 12 miles long, according to Wikipedia. 
and uh, it's 12 miles from end to end. And even though it doesn't look groovy like a record does, it really is. Let me use my fingernail. You can hear me scratching uh, the grooves. So there are grooves, they're just very tiny, which means that the stylus has to be absolutely precise and it has to be very, 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 very small. You'll notice, um, here's the other side, that there are like holographic um, wedges imprinted into the disc. I don't know what those are for. I'm not sure if they're for optical tracking purposes, but they are there, so I have to mention them. They are there, so I have to mention them. Um, but yeah, I really don't know how this works uh, specifically. Um, if the disc is charged by the hub, and there's like a an electrical circuit between the hub and the needle, that much I need to figure out. I'm sure one of you guys is going to comment explaining how one of you might even be the person who was responsible for designing this stuff. So <laughs> it would be kind of cool if one of you guys could chime in and maybe shed some light. Because the wiki article, it, it talks about waveforms, uh, frequency modulation. I get that, but how does it really work? Is there a signal or a electrical current that's sent through the disc? I don't to prove a point, I've brought out this multimeter. And we're now going to check the conductive, conductive properties of the uh, record itself. In case you're wondering, no, I'm not a drug addict. This is actually uh, heat sink grease. Um, this is how uh, it's packed in the industry for um, new system construction. So this is not a drug needle. This is not even a needle at all, actually. It's just heat sink grease. I knew someone was going to comment on that. Hey man, you have a good. No, I'm not. Sorry. Okay, back to our our subject at hand. I'm going to. I'm just going to tell you what the readings are because I can't walk and chew gum here. Um, and again, I'm I'm just incredibly lazy and I don't like wielding wielding tripods around. So, so I have the um, positive probe on the center of the disc near the hub, and I'm now going to contact a couple inches out. I'm getting a resistance reading of 1.26 kiloohms. And 1.6 I get 2. 1.8 1.9 further I move out the higher the resistance no, it seems to vary. It, it seems to be fairly inconsistent. So my theory might actually hold water that the disk completes a circuit between the platter and the stylus. And this is what the RCA Selective Vision looks like on the inside. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, this is your on-off switch, which is fairly complicated. I mean, you've got, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's mechanical, I should say. Not really complicated. But you have a main shaft here with two cam lobes that are adjustable with an Allen key that uh, engage these two micro switches. And that shaft ends right there. But then you have a jack shaft running off of... Where is it running from? It's running off of the end of this um, lever assembly, which not only controls this other jack shaft, but it also connects using linkage to the to the tone arm actuator assembly or servo assembly, whatever you want to call it. I don't give a rat's ass. Um, whatever you call it, it is what it is. So this other jack shaft here goes right here under the machine and it activates two more micro switches. Now these are all position selectors 
that uh, tell the machine whether it's in whatever mode. It, they're like mode selector switches, but there's four of them. And depending on what combination they're, 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 they're engaged, in which they're engaged, um, it uh, will tell the machine whatever function it's selected to. In addition to that, you have another little lever here, and that goes underneath the machine, and that might actually be the motor switch. I think that's what that is, and that engages the drive motor. Um, so the drive motor is right here. I'm going to grab a flashlight so you can get a better look at it. So let's shed some light on the situation. There is the shaded pole drive motor that drives that giant little uh, drum right there. See it? And that is our platter. And I'm going to spin it by hand so you can see it in action. Or in action, baby, if I can. Now, really would be a good time to whip out the tripod, but screw that. Um, let me see if I can demonstrate it for you. So anyway, yeah, you get the idea. Um, the main control board, the logic board, is right here. And it's fairly simple. There's not a lot going on there. I mean, it's just not as busy as you would expect such a you know, complicated machine to be. Well, that's because it's not complicated. Yeah, see what I just did there? Okay. <laughs> anyway, so it has a fairly simple control circuit. You've got your servo section here, your 5-volt supply rail here, your micro com microcomputer or microcontroller here. The display driver goes here. See, back then they used to label things. There's your 22-volt rail here. Stylus lifter. That's the... Um, broke it. I broke it! The stylus lifter is the device that allows it to pause while running and it allows it to um, to advance and retard while the disc is playing. And the stylus lifter, if I'm not mistaken, is this coil here. When this coil is engaged, this little doohickey does its thing. The stylus is lifted off the record, off the disc. Pretty cool, huh? There's a couple of other coils. There are two deflection coils, right? Those little green things. Those are the deflection coils. And I'm just noticing there's like a piece of felt in there, too. I wonder what else might lie underneath that. I wish I could take this off and we can get a better look at it. But that that could potentially damage uh, a couple of things because everything has to be aligned just perfectly. And by ripping this off, I could um, I could cause some irreversible damage. So I'm not doing that. But from the looks of it, the stylus lifter. Trying to figure out how it how it lifts the needle. Let's see, it lines up right about there. There we go. So what it does is it picks up the needle like that. Even makes that noise. I swear to God. So there's our stylus lifter. Now, how does this machine know what position that tone arm should be in? After all, on a standard record player, um, it it automatically loads. If the if the record player uh, supports that function, but when you put the disc down, you lower the tone arm, okay, and the tone arm, which is lightweight, moves on its own by following the spiral track of the LP. Now, on a machine like this, it's servo controlled. So how does it know what position to put this in, and how does it know if it's gone too far? I'll explain that too. The deflection coils actually have a little bit to do with that. If I'm not mistaken, they're actually pickups. And what they're doing... Oh, wait a minute. No, that, that's pretty much what they do. <laughs> and what they're doing is they're, they're following the movement of the needle, or the deflection of the needle. As you can clearly see, you can push it back and forth with your finger. 
what those coils do is they sense the position the needle is in. And if the needle starts to move too far this way, it then compensates for it by dragging the assembly over maybe one or two notches to compensate for that. It's pretty cool. And I'll show you that in action. All right, let's close that up. All right. So what we want to do is figure out if there is any conductivity between the turntable and a loaded video disc. So let's go grab a disc. Okay, we're going to power the unit on, put it in load, and we're going to use Romeo and Juliet to test our theory. Actually, yeah, let's do that. So now it's unlocking and grasping the inner, and we pull out the outer. Pretty slick. And this actually tells us what side we've loaded. We've loaded side one. It has, um, I believe it has a set of fingers that can tell which side we've loaded. So if I flip it upside down, it loads side two. Genius, genius, genius. All right, I'm done with that. Um, so what we're going to do now So as, I, as you can see, the, the switch that engages the motor is a little wonky right now. It's, there it goes. And now, it's, now it's loading. Um, as of right now, if the disc is in good shape, it should be playing the actual beginning of the disc. So um, I'm hoping it's doing that because I need that to work for my demonstration. But... We're going to just fast forward a little bit. Oh yeah, listen to this. That's the needle pickup uh, uh, coil. So it's fast forwarded to... We're going to put it to position one. There we go. And let it do its thing, and then we'll, we'll talk. So what I want to do is I want to use a multimeter to figure out if there's any kind of um, signal being sent to the disk. Let's go ahead and stop it right now. We're, gonna, we're just going to hit the uh, stop key. Let it spin down. At this very moment, I believe that needle is in contact with the uh, vinyl. So let's use a flashlight. We're going to peek inside here very precariously and we're going to see I see the reflection of the assembly but I do not see the needle uh, what if I did this I'm going to look at it from here light shining back No, I'm going to say that the needle is unloaded at this point. So maybe the lifter applies pressure. Nevertheless, we're just going to do this instead. What I'm going to do... Oh, why did I break that again? i got to stop doing that. So in its default position, the needle does not contact the vinyl at all, or the record, whatever you want to call it there. Hmm. So I'm wondering if maybe the deflection coils have some uh, say in where the needle goes. Ooh, I figured something out. I just learned something, and now you will too. I just figured out how the needle 
and the servo work in conjunction to keep everything flowing smoothly. If you look, there's two little prongs that are sticking towards me. And I'll zoom in. Those prongs, when contact, when the needle contacts those prongs, it advances or moves the uh, the tone arm assembly forward or back, which is brilliant. Um, it's just brilliant. <laughs> That's how that works. So the deflection coils are really just there for tracking purposes, and this is definitely the unload load um, uh, coil. So that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. I'm glad we're learning something. That's what these videos are for, so we can learn. We can learn and we can grow. As my kindergarten teacher used to say. And yeah, she really sounded like that. It was sick. Anyway, I think that's like the default voice for kindergarten teachers. But anyway. I've learned a few more things. I'm actually quite proud of this. Um, I determined a couple of different things. Number one, between find something sharp between this contact here and the center hub, when the record is playing or the video disc is playing, there is about 160 millivolts of electricity between the two. So my theory is holding water that in a small charge is sent from the hub to the disc and is picked up by the stylus, which is how the, the capacitance part of this works. Really cool. Um, the other thing I've learned is that the forward and back uh, feature, this is really bizarre, but this is how it works. <laughs> Now I could be wrong. This could just be tracking, but I really think this is it. I think I've I think I've got it. Um, although I could be wrong, and I probably am. But inside here, there is a coil, or it's more like a a, um, a solenoid. You can barely see it, but it moves in and out. So that could be used. It has a very limited range. That could be used. No, no, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna re re retract that. I think that is really just for tracking purposes. But what it does is it, it can move in and out or laterally, and it can push the stylus in or out. Pretty cool. It's magnetic too. So, and that could just be for tracking, but it could also be used uh, to advance a frame or retard. Um, no, you know, that might that might be for timing. That might be for audio-video timing. No, that wouldn't make sense because they're picked up by the same damn needle. Excuse me. I'm having an argument with myself. But nevertheless, I can also show you the needle or stylus lifter assembly while it's in action. That's lifted. That's dropped. Show you again. Lift it. Dropped. Lift, drop. I pick things up, I put them down. There you go. For your entertainment. It's all for your entertainment. And these little deflection coils are really for needle deflection, so we, we get that. And then you've got those two uh, pickups right there. If I were to short between that little gold contact here and one of these, this would move. Okay. I think we're getting somewhere, guys. Cool. Pretty cool. Now, let's do another uh, quick once over of the mechanism as a whole. Um, what we have here is our tone arm position sensor. It uses the 
fingers to determine what position it counts fingers. It's like the accountant finger counter, see? It uses an optical sensor to determine position. There you go. Like that? Alright. Now, the control motor for the tone arm assembly is about as basic as it gets. It's just a single, uh, I'm sorry, just a regular DC motor. Um, same kind of motor that you'd find driving the cap stand in your cassette player. No different. It's actually, that is the kind of motor it is. And it drives a warm gear. It drives a belt, which drives a reduction gear, which then transfers power to this here worm gear, which is then mounted to a clutch shaft. Let me show you what I mean by that. When it reaches its limit, it still spins, but it doesn't grind gears. That's what a clutch, that's what a limited slip clutch does. Just a felt pad against a, um, like a, a large plastic plate. And as I mentioned earlier, when the unit is stopped and in the load unload position, like right now it's in off, this is still engaged. Okay, but when I move it to the load unload position, this frees up. And that is how the outer sleeve can return the tone arm back to its position. Really don't have much else to show you guys. We've gone over about every possible thing we, I can think of. Um, other than pulling off the bottom cover, which there's really not much under there. There's another, there's, a, there's one more circuit board, but, eh, life's short. Let's party. No, really though, um, that is it. That's all to show you. So yes, RCA did lose about 600 was it $600 million on this idea? Um, because it just didn't win over the hearts and minds of the American buying public. Uh, we are on side two, so I'm going to put side two. This is a, this is a good example of a two-part movie. There's two parts to this. Why can't I do this? Is the door open? Yes. There we go. Pull that out. I just love how simple and effective and reliable this caddy system is. I mean, this is brilliant. This is brilliant right here. Guys, come on. Just when I called it brilliant, it freaking malfunctions on me. There we go. Nice. And uh, we'll take a look at one that's been disassembled. This is a... Uh, no, it's not disassembled. But let's, let's put one in without a disc in it. It's not going to know what to do. It's going to be like, what is wrong with you? No disc. <laughs> I, wonder if it'll, uh, I wonder if it'll try to play it. Let's see what happens. Because all of the catches and all the micro switches are engaged, so it should think there's a disc in there, but there won't be. rubbing. There you go. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, so the rubbing noise wasn't what I thought it was. Let's get a shot of that motor starting up, shall we? Let me try to position my camera here. There we go. So there must be a stop, a stop pad in there somewhere. Because when, yeah, when the um, when the when the carousel, 
<laughs> when the platter lowers down, it hits a felt break. That's what it does. I thought that noise was actually the disc scrap scratching against the um, platter itself. So it wasn't what I thought it was. I thought it was awful. So, but anyway, um, we're going to try to put this back in the sleeve. Or not. Screw that. Use it as a frisbee. It's ruined anyway. In all my experimentation, I've ruined it. I have ruined the disc. Pop that out. Pop that in. There we go. All right, that's going in the garbage. But I'm going to save the disc because it's really cool looking, even though it's kind of ruined. Oh. Well. Anyway, folks, that was the RCA. The hell is this thing called? Selectivision video disc player. And the model number is SFT100W. And it was made in Bloomington, Indiana. Made in USA. Good old American craftsmanship. 33 freaking years old and it still works. I love it. But it's time to say goodbye. I gotta get ready for bed. It's getting late. And, um,. I'm going to watch some Muppets. Don't judge me.